virtual program. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you are well among all of this craziness in our world right now. Um, tonight, our curator, Barbara, is going to talk about the mills of Exeter, the industries that developed around the Exeter and Squamscott rivers, lumber, cotton, wool, muskets, paper, flour, potato starch, gunpowder. Yay! Okay, if you are a member of the society, thank you. If you aren't, please consider becoming a member. We really count on our members to keep programs like this going. Um, you can find membership information on our website, www.exeterhistory.org. Um, all support is welcome and appreciated. Before we get started, I just want to mention the status of our April and May programs from 2020. Um, unfortunately, our April program um, must be held in person, so it is postponed indefinitely. Our May program will be held via Zoom on Tuesday, September 1st at 7 p.m. So we don't normally have a September program, so we're just moving May to September. We hope you can make it. Details will be forthcoming. Um, as far as tonight is concerned, Barbara will be taking questions during and after the program. Our trustee, Jillian Price, will be monitoring the Q&A dialog box, which um, I believe is at the bottom of your screen. Many of you have found it already. Um, and sorry, feel free to, to type your questions there. If you are listening on Facebook or YouTube, you can write your questions in the comments and we'll try to get to those as well. Lastly, if you um, would like to watch on a different platform or have any issues, you can navigate to Exeter TV's Facebook page or their YouTube channel or watch on channel 98. And with that, I'm gonna toss it over to Barbara. Well, good evening, everyone. This is an exciting new way of bringing a program to everyone. I'm actually at the Exeter Historical Society. I'm, I'm a little privileged because I'm the only one allowed in the building most of the time. So um, I'm here in my usual Exeter History Minute seat. Um, tonight's program is going to be about the mills of Exeter. And um, when Laura was asking me, what do you want to highlight about it? I mean, it was one of those 1030 at night texts that I frequently get from Laura. And so I was shouting answers at her in caps. That's why she kind of made that funny remark at the beginning. But I am going to try and hit on most of the mills that uh, were talked about in the description. And to do this, I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you that's got some illustrations. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Should be right there. I'll get a nod from Jillian when she sees it. Yep, okay, we've got it, excellent. Okay, um, this is not a picture from Exeter. It's an old engraving from some book that I found. I originally created this program back in 2003 and then I updated it in 2011. So if you've seen parts of this already, maybe out at Riverwoods or at a civic group or something, um, I've updated it again this morning because I can never do the same thing twice. Okay. So the first thing we need to know about tonight, let me get my cursors working here, is that we're only gonna to talk tonight, I'm only gonna to talk to you tonight about mills that are water powered. So we're not gonna talk about uh, industries in Exeter that didn't use water power. So we're gonna start at the sort of the beginning of when Europeans arrive and begin to harness the river. Now this photo that you see here is a modern day picture, not too modern, it's probably the 1980s, picture of the, the river system that we're talking about. And as you can see, here's a river here, snaking down through town. That's the Exeter River. And it is a freshwater river that comes in all the way from Chester. I think it's 32 miles of river, something like that. It's quite a long river. And it varies, it meanders a lot, which means it's an older river. And it flows down into the center of town right here, which is where our public library is located and where the two bridges, Great Bridge, which is right here, and String Bridge over here meet. And at this point, this freshwater river spills into this other river that you see here, this wider river that comes around. That is the Squamscott River. And it is a tidal river that goes all the way out to Great Bay and then to the Atlantic Ocean. So it's salty, it's tidal, it's got a very different composition to it, different wildlife, different environment. 
and it comes in and out daily. So it's a very different system. So it's important to know that these are two different rivers, even though when you're looking at them from overhead or if you're looking at them on a map, it looks like it's one big river. It's actually two. Now the indigenous population that lived here for maybe 3000 years or so, uh, came here seasonally and settled into certain parts of town out here and out in this area. And uh, they came in the winter time, at the very end of winter, what we would consider early spring and settled in and uh, planted some small crops, which was probably uh, simple corn and squash and beans. And they also fished in the rivers and went clamming and probably collected oysters, hunted. Uh, it was very woody at the time. You can see right now in this, this photo, it's not very, not, not a lot of trees in Exeter right now, but it's got more trees now than it did about 200 years ago. Um, but anyway, we're gonna talk about how they use the river. So the native populations mostly harnessed the river for a food source. And the way they did this was uh, the Squamscott River would have fish traps on it called weirs. And that's how they would capture fish. And that was as much of the technology as they would use. When Europeans start arriving in the 1630s, however, they saw one part of town, this center part of town, where there were waterfalls. Now, as we've all discovered since the dam has come out in the last few years, the waterfalls aren't exactly gushing falls that come down. It's really more like a series of ledges and ripples that come through. So it's not, not the fast moving um, waterfalls that you might have assumed it would be. There is also running wa gushing water up in this region, up, up river, and that's also useful. So anywhere you have moving water, you're gonna be able to harness that for water power to move machinery. And that is exactly what the Europeans did. They had two big needs that native indigenous people didn't have. That's a redundant way of phrasing it, but they, were, they had two big needs. One was they needed lumber to build houses, and two was they needed to grind grains into flour or meal because of the way that they ate their food and the way that they constructed their houses. So those were two things they needed, and they needed power to do it. There are two areas in the center of town that make for good waterfalls. Now, both of these are constructed waterfalls that we're gonna see. This is because there is a dam there. This is where, this is string bridges up here. And you know that string bridge is actually two bridges, right? With a little island in the middle that's kind of a manufactured island, but it's there nonetheless. So this is actually a dammed up area at the time that this photo was taken, probably in the 1850s. And then we also have the upper falls. Again, you see a waterfall here, which you don't see today because this is actually a dam and there's a big water impound behind it. So both of these are constructed. So you see waterfalls in these pictures, but it's mostly just moving water. I wanted to stress that that's what's important. Okay, to build a water wheel. Okay, I've taken this illustration from one of my favorite childhood sources of information, which was Eric Sloan. He wrote a series of books, American Barnes, and he did a lot of books with tools in them. And I just, I just love the, the physics of some of these things. Early water wheels uh, were efficient in certain ways and were useful in certain ways. The one that you see at the top is called an undershot wheel. That means as he has clearly illustrated, the water is underneath, the wheel goes in a clockwise direction and they're pretty efficient. Most likely this is the kind of wheel that we had in Exeter. The overshot wheel, on the other hand, the water comes in and it goes across the top and it makes the wheel go counterclockwise. It uses gravity to move the wheel rather than the movement of the water. And it's much more efficient. The bottom one is called a breast wheel, sometimes called a tide wheel. And that uses the motion of the water coming in and out uh, with the tide. Now, all of these types of wheels were probably used at some point in Exeter. It's hard to know which one was used for what type of mill. But my assumption is that uh, the way the water moves in town, it's most likely you're going to see mostly these undershot wheels. I think when I did this program once, I had someone who used to work at the extra manufacturing company who told me that uh, the big mill in the downtown, that it was actually a tub mill, which is a completely different type of uh, wheel that I don't have an illustration for. So that's entirely possible as, as well. The first mill that was built in Exeter after John Wheelwright arrived with his settlers in 1638 was uh, one that was on the Really, this I'm standing on String Bridge when I took this picture this afternoon. 
It was very hot. And um, <laughs> the first mill they built was one by Thomas Wilson in 1640. And that mill was a grist mill. The word grist means any kind of grain. And they were grinding grains into meal or into flour. The things that the Europeans were growing, they're English. So they're growing things like barley. And all of these could be ground into flour. And a grist mill was probably the most important mill for them to get because before this time, from 1638 until 1640, the way that you ground your grain into flour was to use a mortar and pestle. So that, you know, bang, bang with a big um, mortar and pestle. And that must that was hard work. Or they may have used a, a hand mill, which you, know, you have a crank on the top. But all of these are difficult methods. Typically, uh, Thomas Wilson was granted the right to build his grist mill, and he had to give everybody access to it. He generally earned his keep by uh, grinding the grain for shares. So you didn't have to pay him in cash. You simply could pay him in a couple of bushels full of whatever flour or grain you were having ground. And then they needed lumber because Englishmen like to build houses out of wood. And so they had to cut the wood up. They, they weren't makers of log cabins. Log cabins really hadn't been invented at this time. They probably made houses similar to other English houses, which were sort of a post and beam, wattle and daub kind of style, which meant that you had big pieces holding up the skeleton of the building and the walls themselves were probably what's called wattle and daub, which is intertwining branches and then they plaster over it with mud. But anyway, they did need some big beams to do this. In order to cut those back in the day, you could hand cut them with a tool called an adz or you could do uh, open pit sawing, which is what you see the men doing here in another great Eric Sloan illustration. And pit sawing has uh, a lot of problems with it. Uh, we know they were doing this a lot in Exeter because in the earliest records of the town, I was just reading them the other day, they were talking about if anybody has an open pit as for sawing logs spelled with two Gs, they need to fill it in or cover it or surround it by a certain date. In other words, these deep pits that they dug, and they're probably eight or nine feet down, um, were dangerous because people could fall in them or their cows could fall in them, or their pigs could fall in them, they could really get hurt. The other problem with pit sawing is, of course, the poor person on the bottom is actually getting a face full of sawdust every single time that saw comes downward. Uh, you'll see that one man is wearing a, a wide-brimmed hat, very practical purposes there, so you needed to do that. But anyway, this was laborious work, and it took a long time, and it, it was difficult. What would make it easier? A sawmill. So the town of Exeter looked for someone who had lumbering in their background, and they gave the grant to Edward Gilman, which is not what this is an illustration of. <laughs> this illustration is to show you that within just a few years, and actually we're 120 years on, but the first century or so of Exeter's history, lumber was our industry. I mean, we were settled by some religious dissenters, but we were not a religious colony. Um, we became a kind of a wild and crazy lumber town for a long time. So this is actually an account book that was kept by John Gidding, who lived right over by, uh, the, the house is no longer there. His house is, it's in Dearborn, Michigan now, but that's another long story. Um, he lived right on, the, right on the river, the Squamscott River, and he traded up and down the river. He brought in goods from the West Indies, most of them slave-produced slave products. So keep that in mind as you're looking at this, that anything that he is selling or trading for here is probably something that has been uh, created by enslaved people. And in payment, he would take whatever people were willing to trade. And we went through this book, and it begins in the late 18, 1750s, and it goes right up until about the Revolution. And it was fascinating to transcribe because we discovered that people did not use cash hardly ever at all. They paid one another off by working for a day or uh, having the guy that owes you money working for a day for someone else. But what was most noticeable about it from our perspective was how often, this is the contra side. So this is, this is the purchases for Biley Lyford right here, Captain Biley Lyford in 1767. And these are the things he's purchasing. He's purchasing sugar and tea 
cloth and I can't read that one. Uh, some flour, some paper, some salt, some rum, some rum, uh, lots of things that he could buy, more rum uh, from the West Indies products. And over here on the other side uh, is how he paid for it, the Contra side, okay? And he's paying for it with boards, boards and joists, which is a larger beam. He's paying with more board. Uh, he tells you ex exactly how many feet, more board here. Um, and you really never see him paying for anything with cash. So Biley Lyford is mostly paying for things with boards because lumber actually became our, our, our currency for a long time. They, they traded and they, there's a lot of fish and there's a lot of lumber. But lumber was the big industry. Here's a sawmill, which shows you how a sawmill works. I don't know who that person is in the picture. They are forever in my vacation photos from whenever this was done. Uh, this is at Sturbridge Village. If you've ever get a chance to go down there, you can see this big sawmill. And if you're lucky, uh, as we were that day, they had it up and running. And here's the, 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 um, the wheel. This is an undershot wheel. The water comes in through here. These sluices open up and it pushes the wheel in this direction. Um, this child is now 21 years old, just so you know how old this is. <laughs> and this is what a typical lumber mill might look like. So the ones that were in Exeter were probably similar to this. This one's in Kingston. It's an old photo. But you can see that the river has been dammed. There is an impound of water behind this, and it is the water coming through here that is also being somewhere sluiced through, probably over here to the mill house. And then over here, the power is cutting the pieces of lumber. Um, a lumber mill usually had an open end at this end and an open end at this end, so you could better bring lumber in and move it through. Okay. I just have to find out where, where I am in my notes here. Okay. <laughs> Once you had a water wheel all set up, as Eric Sloan is showing us here, you could attach it to just about anything. I mean, as long as you had that power moving, you could, um, you could, you could mill lumber, you could grind grain, you could run a bellows for a forge, you could pound with a trip hammer, He's using it as a winch on one side there, and even for a molding plane. You really could attach just about anything to a water wheel. And the power was essentially free, right? And, um, you know, you're, you're troubling no one, providing there aren't conflicts between different people who need the water, because you frequently do have to create a dam and an impound, and then you're going to be using water that other people might also want to be using. Now, for the first 150 years or so of our town's existence, really the types of mills that you see are going to be lumber mills and grist mills. Those were the two big needs, and lumber mills really took off as the lumber industry took off. Great Britain was very short on um, trees, and so anything that we could ship them was like money in the bank. So uh, that was the big industry in town. And then comes the revolution. And we had other needs at that point in time. We had other needs and we needed to harness the river to do other things. Which brings us to the next part of this, which is gunpowder. 1776, right at the beginning of the American Revolution, Samuel Hobart bought the rights up at the King's Falls. King's Falls is up today. I'll show you on a map in a moment, but it's up sort of where Riverwoods is. So if you're out on Powder Mill Road, Powder Mill is named for the gunpowder mills. Um, that's where the gunpowder factory was in 1776. Now, Samuel Hobart's gunpowder was considered to be quite good, judged in every respect equal to any imported from Europe, they said. And he created, he made gunpowder throughout the American Revolution. And then when it was done, he just converted the factory over to nails. Didn't need so much gunpowder, but we sure needed nails by that time. The gunpowder mill then sort of remains as a different type of mill for a long time until 1838, when Oliver Whipple buys it and creates the King's Mills Powder Company. Now, this one's notable because it was more automated. What you're seeing here is a big wheel, and what that is actually doing is it's traveling around in a circle, and it is grinding together the three basic ingredients of gunpowder. 
which is saltpeter, sulfur, and charcoal. And it's pushing it together. You have to do this very carefully because if there's any kind of fire or spark or if the machines overheat, even when it's just uh, water that's powering it, the whole thing will blow up, which indeed happened. This is just a filler picture because this is not a gunpowder manufactory. This is the Exeter Powder House. But the reason I put this photo in here is because we frequently get asked, why is the Powder House sitting on the outskirts of town? You know, you can see it from Swayze Parkway. You have to look across the way and it's like, that seems inconvenient if the British are coming to attack. We have to go all the way over there to get our gunpowder. Now, the reason you keep it on the outskirts of town is because if it blows up, Whoops. If it blows up, all of that just becomes a missile. Sorry, I hit my touchpad. All of the, every single brick will become a missile and go right through you. So you have to be very cautious about that. Well, like the powder house, which is used just for storage, uh, a gunpowder factory can also explode. And the one that was being run out at uh, the Kings Falls, but this time it's William Whipple's Kings, Kings Mills Gunpowder Company, blew up three times during the course of its existence. In August of 1840, it blew up and it was such a loud explosion that they heard it all the way in Newburyport and Haverhill, Massachusetts. <laughs> so that must have been quite an explosion. Miraculously, no one was injured, which is amazing. But the area was completely flattened. There were boards, they said, rods away. So it was, it was pretty, pretty wild. And then it blows up again in May of 1843. They said in the newspaper, the accounts say that it's not as large of an explosion, but the explosion was similar to the one, still pretty loud, uh, as the one that they had experienced three years before. And then things calmed down for about seven years, I guess. They were doing everything cautiously. You can add a little water to that saltpeter and charcoal and sulfur mix, and that makes it more of a paste, but it's still pretty explosive. In 1850, however, Charles Smith was in the grinding room and the whole thing blew up again. And this time it was quite tragic. Charles Smith was killed. In fact, they found body parts of him hanging all over town, pieces of wood, shingles, everything all over the place. Because when a gunpowder mill blows up, it really blows up. This isn't Exeter, this is in England, but this is what it looks like when a gunpowder mill blows up. 1850 was the end of gunpowder manufacturing in Exeter. I mean, once you blow up your, your chief employee, um, it's probably time to finish. The mill area and the rights to the river there were sold to William Hunnewell, who then created hubs, spokes, and shingles. You keep to things that aren't going to blow up. It's a little safer. However, mills in Exeter continued to grow, and there were a lot of different types. George Washington comes to town in 1789, and at that time, these were the kinds of mills that we had. We had 10 grist mills, because you need food. We had one paper mill, talk about that in a minute. We had a fulling mill. A fulling mill is actually uh, sometimes called a woolen mill. When the wool is felted or it is woven together, fulling is the process where you wet it and you beat it and it pushes the fibers together to make it pretty much waterproof. Uh, but it is tedious work. So if you can get a mill wheel to just keep banging that away, it's much better. A slitting mill was used to make nails by slicing a sheet of iron over and uh, back and forth so that it cuts a new nail each time the blade comes down. Snuff mill ground tobacco into a fine powder so that you could get that really fun sneeze that people who use snuff enjoy. There were two chocolate mills in town, according to accounts. I've never figured out exactly where they are, but there are apparently chocolate mills in town too, because again, that's something like coffee that needs to be ground. Six sawmills which is still a lot of sawmills for a town that is running out of lumber by this time. A tobacco factory, two oil mills. Oil mills ground linseed oil, which is a byproduct of the linen uh, trade. Um, you grind those seeds down and you can get linseed oil and then the leftover husks are used as cattle food. And then one ironworks that was somewhere right around the downtown. So that's a lot of mills. That is a lot of mills. Here's a map. 
from 1802 that shows you the mills, just the ones that are clustered right around the, the area in the downtown. So to orient yourselves, here is what we call Great Bridge today. So the sea dog is right here. Okay, and then over here you have the String Bridge, which is in, even in 1802 is called String Bridge, named for the big stringer logs that originally laid it out. You can see the mill dams here are these bulges that come out, and you don't see Kimball's Island at all. You only see ledge. I mentioned before that that island seems to be a, a man-made product, and it was probably like a dry area at some point, and then it just gets built over the years. But you can see all the different types of mills. Here's the, the Gilman lumber mills are still here up by the Great Bridge, and this is their original dam, which probably went up in the 1640s. Clustered around it, you see a, a D. Clark's grist mill, Wiggins oil mill, Clark's fulling mill. Uh, can't tell what that one says. This is Clifford's Mill. I think that's also a lumber mill. Here's Brooks Grist Mill, Gilman's Saw Mill. And another one I can't quite make out on this particular slide. I'd have to look at the original map. But all of these mills are clustered in here. And upriver, so here you are coming out of town. If you're in the center of town down here, you drive out this way. This is Pickpocket Road here. Oh, excuse me. This is Pickpocket Road here. Sorry. Here we go. Easy to get yourself turned around here. This is the river coming through here. Okay, so in 1802, um, what you can see from mills here is Captain William Hale's mill up near Pickpocket. And then you down here, you will see the Barstow's. We'll talk about Barstow's mills in a minute, but this area right in here, we've already had, this is where the gunpowder mills were. And now the area is being used by uh, Joshua Barstow. And we'll get to Joshua Barstow. No, oh, we won't because we're gonna talk about paper mills first. <laughs> Sorry, paper mills and then muskets. Paper was terribly badly needed at this point after the American Revolution. We're in about, this is an advertisement from uh, 1813 and they're advertising for rags. And the reason they're advertising for rags is because that's what they use to make paper. I'm gonna pull my sharing off just for a minute so you can see me for a second, hopefully. <laughs> I see Laura. Um, <laughs> if you can see me though, I'm gonna show you some paper that was most likely made in Exeter. This is a newspaper from the 1780s. And you can see how the edge is all quite ragged. I mean, this is not a finished type of paper. You certainly wouldn't want to use something like this to you know, emboss the American Declaration of Independence on or anything. This is just a newspaper. And it's sort of a heavy weight. It's a rather crude type of paper, but it was very badly needed because we'd become a kind of the printing industry had come in after the lumber industry to replace it. And so it was very important that people were able to make paper. But if you're gonna make paper, can you see my screen again, I hope? Wait a minute, maybe I did not share it with everyone. Hang on. All right. <laughs> Give me a second. For some reason, I'm having trouble getting back to the program. And instead, it is stuck on this. I'm going to try to escape and see where I go. OK. Let me get back to where you all are. Here we are. OK. Sorry about that. I'm going to try sharing my screen again. This time, I'll do it properly. And we should be able to find it again. Get it back into slideshow mode. There we go. Not the one we're looking at yet. Okay, good recovery, Barbara. Okay, um, <laughs> you did need to you did need to provide something to create that paper out of, and what they used was any kind of fabrics that were left over, textile waste, and textile waste really depended on a lot of 
um, uh, women actually, it's uh, the women who did all the sewing and they were the ones who provided clean rags. The rags were then put into a machine, something like this, which manually would sort of grind them up and make this, this slurry that you then produced, that you then laid out on a, on a uh, screen and dried, and that would become paper and would run through some rollers to try and make it smooth. Exeter's attempts at this were, were okay. I mean, I was just showing you a newspaper, but a lot of times, um, you know, if you were going to cut it in and make it into a book because we had a pretty good printing industry for a while, uh, they'd have to use a better quality paper. The paper mills in Exeter, which were out at the same place the old powder mills were, um, changed hands a lot. Here's the line we've got. The first paper mill that went in Exeter was in 1777. Richard Jordan purchased the first one out at the uh, Kings Falls. And he sold it to Ali Follette and William Hale in 1787. They sold it to Stephen and Gideon Lamson in 1806. They sold it to Enoch Wiswall in 1813. And then Thomas and Isaac Flagg, the manufacturers of this paper, this is a paper wrapper for a ream of paper, um, had it from 1815 to 1871. So that's a long time to have a paper mill. Now, this isn't the same kind of paper mill that you find like in Maine, where you had those big smelly mills that were very chemical. The, this was a lot different, although they did use a lot of bleach in the process of making it. But this was all right out in that area, probably on the nature trails behind the river woods um, today. In 1871, the paper mill was destroyed by fire. And after that, it was not rebuilt again. This is the account book of Captain Joseph Fernald, who was shipping goods up and down the Squamscott River between Exeter and Portsmouth. And I like this page from his ledger because he's keeping track, this is 1821, he's keeping track of Wiswall and Flagg's paper industry. And you can see as you go through it that they are shipping things, cotton was coming up river and then paper was going down river and then rags were coming up river and paper going down. And you see the pattern, rags up, paper down, the whole way through. And if I had shown you the other side of this, which would show how Flag and Wiswald were paying for these services, they were no longer, this is 1821, they are no longer paying for things in goods. The Flag and Wiswald paid for everything in cash, except for one time they paid in fish. I guess they were short on cash that day, so but there was cod. So they paid for it in fish. Um, the Wiswald and uh, the uh, Captain Fernald used a variety of different ships to go up and down. He used a ship called a packet and also a gundalo. If you can see my face anywhere on the screen, here's a gundalo coming across. <laughs> it's a flat bottom boat that was particularly useful for tidal rivers like the Squamscott because when the tide went out and there's nothing but mud flats, a gundalo can just sit upright. It's not going to have, it's not going to tip over like another boat. So it's, it's very useful for using in this type of area. And that was one of the things that Captain Fernald did. So he's not a mill, but he, he was important at the in, in the industry. The other industry I talked about in that region, right up on that Kings Falls area, up on Powder Mill Road, was uh, Joshua Barstow's muskets. Here's an example that we have at the Exeter Historical Society. He had quite a business. He started it in 1797, so after the American Revolution. So he's, he's uh, you know, providing muskets for the general population. When the War of 1812 comes, he does get a government contract. It was supposed to be a five-year contract to produce 2,500 muskets, for which he would be paid $10.75 each. And he should have gotten really wealthy off of this. Here's the stock if you want to take a peek at it. This is one of the official muskets that was made for the... the um, War of 1812, you can see it's got the United States Eagle on it. it says it was made in Exeter. Um, and here it's J&C, which is Joshua and Charles Barstow. It's a beautiful example that we have in our collections, uh, made right here in town. Um, and that's all parts of it. They handmade all of these parts right out at, uh, in that area. However, the government did not uh, keep their side of the bargain. And poor Joshua Barstow had trouble getting them inspected because before you could hand them off to soldiers, they have to be properly inspected and make sure that they're proofed so you can actually use them. He had trouble getting people to do that. Uh, the bills that he, he, he got, checks that bounced. 
And eventually he sold most of his muskets to the general population who would pay him $15 a musket instead of $10.75 each. So it, the, the government contract didn't prove profitable, but Joshua Barstow had a pretty good business going for a while. Uh, if you're a collector finding collections of these, uh, that's, that's a pretty good gun to have. Yeah. And who is this man? This is Dr. William Perry. Now he's he's kind of an older man in this position in this particular photograph, and he he looks a little bit scary. But in real life, he was a very beloved physician in town, and he was an old time doctor. So he believed in bleeding and purging. Um, he also did operations. They said he did his final gallbladder operation when he was in his eighties, and that was a very delicate procedure at that time. He comes to town in the 1820s, and along with being a great general practitioner, taking care of everybody in town, he was also a fairly good dentist, and he would actually be able to make replacement teeth for you and do minor dental work. In fact, people in town sometimes like Dr. Perry a little more than they like the general dentist. I don't know why. Maybe he gave you more opium. Who knows? Um, but anyway, he was also uh, fascinated by the industrial world. And in the 1820s, there were new cotton mills going up in Lowell. And one of the things that was needed for the processing of cotton was a starch that could be used for the sizing of the fabric. After the fabric is woven, it's a little bit bumpy. And so they coat it with some thin layer of starch and put it through rollers to make it nice and smooth. Now, cotton was a unique product anyway. Up until this time, we didn't have cottons that much. Um, it was It's an unusual crop. It grows in hot places. And most of the Europeans who lived here, of course, were from the cold climate, where the primary sources of fabric were wools and linens, or wool and linen mixed together twisted together. So those were your basic fabrics. And along comes this, this cotton that comes from the India trade and it's lightweight. It feels like featherweight on a person's body. And you can do marvelous things to it if you are a seamstress and it dries rather quickly. Uh, unlike wool, you know, if you've ever dried out a pair of wool socks, you know, if you don't put it on the radiator, it's going to take about three days to dry. So this is like a miracle product and people loved it. And it's one of the things that spurred on the Industrial Revolution, of course, starting in Great Britain and then moving on to the United States. So William Perry was astute enough to realize that if there was some other way of getting starch instead of the, the processes that had been used, some place that you could get it in the United States. And so he created a potato starch mill. Because what do we have in New Hampshire? We have potatoes. I mean, you can grow them in the dirt with all the rocks. So this is trying to show you where the potato starch mill was because I don't have any illustrations of it. It's not on any of the maps because it existed between the times of the maps. But anyway, if you orient yourself, what you're seeing here, here's the Ioka. Here is String Bridge. Here is Great Bridge. This is the Sea Dog. This building is no longer there. This is Long Block which was housing for people who worked at the mill. And right in this area here, somewhere in this area here, just as you came over the bridge, there was a potato starch mill. And the accounts that we have of it was that when it was potato season, which is in the fall, the wagons would be lined up all along these roads to deliver potatoes to the potato starch mill. And you would think that William Perry probably made a fortune off of this, but unfortunately, he didn't. I mean, for a few years there, he was the primary supplier for the Lowell Mills for cotton sizing, which used his potato starch. The mill burned down. It burned down twice. And um, after the second time, he finally decided that maybe he should go back to practicing medicine. Now, he either didn't patent his, me his method for creating potato starch or someone just flat out stole it because those were the days that you could get away with that kind of thing. And he lost control of the product and he decided he was just going to go back to being a regular family physician. Of course, he lived right up over here one of these buildings up on Front Street. Um, and so he just, he, just, he just let it go at that point. You know, once you burn down a couple of your factories, I guess it's time to move on. And that's what he did. But try to imagine for those few years, from about 1824 until about 1830, try to picture Exeter as a huge potato town and the ox carts just clogging up traffic all through town. Must've been quite interesting. By 1845, we see fewer mills. 
Here we are on the outskirts, outskirts of town. We're on the Brentwood Kingston line. <laughs> okay, here you are coming out of town. Here's good old Pickpocket Road again. There is a saw and grist mill up here on the border. Still says that there's powder mills existing down here, which we know is gonna stop in 1850. But you really don't see um, many other mills out here. And indeed in the downtown by 1845, there are two little sawmills, one on Kimball's Island and one just over the bridge. There's still a dam here. And there's one little grist mill. But what you do see is big mill complex over here on the other side of the river, where today there's this, a couple of old mill buildings that are now housing. And the Exeter Manufacturing Company owned all of this area. What had happened was in the late, eight, in the, uh, late 1820s, a company called the Exeter Mill and Power Company, Exeter Water and Power Company, began buying up the holdings of all the small mills along the Exeter River. And for all we know, they probably bought out William Perry. Um, so all of the rights to the water get bought out by this one company. And when they incorporate, they are the Exeter Manufacturing Company. It says 1827, that's actually when they started buying up the rights and not when they actually opened up the business because it takes a few years before they build the cotton textile mill on the bank, the west, uh, excuse me, the east side of the river where we see it today. It's not the same buildings that were there. They, they build their first in the 18, 1829. And then there are a series of fires over the year. I think I have a picture of it. This is one of the agreements uh, for the stockholders. And these are all the, the, the men that you see around town. Here's Nathaniel Gilman. Here's Theodore Moses, who is actually a, um, a wool uh, tradesmen at that point in time, um, and they become the Exeter Manufacturing Company. I think Daniel Webster bought shares in it. I mean, it, it was it was popular. The first uh, employees that they hired were mill girls. Now, if you've ever gone down to the Lowell Mills, you've heard about the factory girls, and the factory girls lived in boarding houses. They were youngish girls. They were late teenagers, I guess you would call them. And they worked in the mill. They came from farms in the area. So they were good American stock, which is to say white Anglo-Saxon Protestant girls from the farms. The, the, the belief was, well, you know, they, they worked on the farm and they got up at dawn and they worked until night on the farm. So, I mean, how bad could it be to also work in a mill where, you know, it's light labor. All you're doing is flipping spindles and, and uh, you know, threading needles. It doesn't seem like it's that much. So, I mean, the shifts at the Exeter Manufacturing Company were 12 and three quarters hour a day until 1847. Well, anybody that's ever worked in a, an industrial or any kind of job where you're on a uh, you know, continuous work cycle like that knows that it's, it's hard to do that all day. When you're on a farm, you may get up at dawn, but first you milk the cows, then you feed the chickens, then you have breakfast, then you take the cows out, then maybe you do a little gardening, then maybe you hang out some laundry. I mean, there's a lot of different tasks that you're doing throughout the day. And it doesn't, it's not as wearying as it is working in a factory. There was no understanding back then of how hard this could be on a person physically or emotionally. The mill girl system didn't work very well in Exeter. The mill only hired about 125 or so people for a long time, and there wasn't a lot of work, not like in Lowell, where there were many, many, many different mills. We only had this one big one. Um, and so it was more, it was, it was better for the, for the mills actually to hire whole families of people. The people they liked to hire were skilled workers who were immigrants, when by a skilled, I mean people who had worked in factories over in England. So when we did a big immigration study a few years ago, what we discovered was the people who were working in the mills tended to be English and Scottish people who had emigrated over fairly recently. They spoke English, they knew what the uh, mill would be like, probably mills in New England were probably better than working in mills in the UK where they were more dark and, and horrific than they were here. 1854, the workday was lowered to only 11 hours, <laughs> party time. 
uh, but you started early in the morning and you ended late at night. A lot of times you were working in the dark. These, the mill was very, very dark as well. The windows provided most of the lighting and what they couldn't find through that, they used whale oil for whale oil lamps, which don't provide a lot of light. Um, I had an account of somebody who said that they found a lot when they when they converted over from whale oil. They they just dumped all the lamps somewhere in the building and they found them in 1918 when they were doing some renovation work. Um, when they say they hired the family, they hired everyone, mother, father, children. There were no rules about how old or young a child could be to work in a mill until 1900. And even then, the age, the lowest age of, to work was set at 14. So uh, you had to get a work permit at 14 if you were going to work in the mills. But before that, you know, 10 year olds could be working in this mill. Um, it, could, it could be any age. So it was pretty punishing life. Margaret Kucharski remembers that when she worked in the mill in the 1920s, that there was still no running water on the inside. You got your, your uh, if you needed a drink of water, you had a bucket and a dipper that were held outside and there were no lunch breaks. You kind of ate while you were working uh, because there really weren't labor laws back then. Plus, there was a whole section of this mill that was called the bleachery, which was using, uh, you know, pretty caustic chemicals that could harm you. All of those chemicals, of course, are later dumped into the river, into the Squamscot, along with uh, two open sewer pipes that came from the town. And all of that came in and out with the tide. It must have been a terrible, smelly place to live and work for many, many years. There were a couple of fires that took out the original building complexes. So none of the buildings that are there today go all the way back to the 1820s, for, as far as I know. Here's some of the regulations from 1854. So this is the time period when they're at about 11 hours. So you can see that the hours of work changes throughout the year. And the reason for that is that, that problem of having lighting available you needed to be able to see. So in September, um, you know, the, the times when you started were different. So during April, May, June, July, and August, you leave at 6 p.m. Um, and when does it start in the morning? <sighs> see, they, they ring the bells. You had to live within five minutes of the mill. That was one of their rules as well. First bell rings at 4.30, second at 5.30, and the third at 6.20. I think you had to be there about six o'clock in the morning. Oh, those are the dinner bells. Oh, boy. This is what happens when I don't wear my right, correct uh, glasses. Okay, yeah, there it is. March 20th to September 19th. Work starts at 6.30 in the morning, um, and then you leave at 6.30 in the evening, except on Saturday, when I think you probably had a half day. Yay. And then in the wintertime, you started at 7 a.m. I don't know how much light you got in that half hour, but there's no daylight savings time then either, so figure that into it. Um, so they, they could be they could be pretty harsh rules sometimes, and they could fire you if you showed up late too often. The mill was run exclusively by water power until the 1870s. This meant that in the summertime when the river was low, and if you look at the river even right now, it's pretty low right now. Um, they didn't if they didn't have enough water maintained in the impound coming through the penstock to run the the, the mill the w wheels. Um, they would just shut down for the summer. They would just tell all their employees, okay, uh, don't have enough power, you're all furloughed. And it could be, you know, there were some years you read about it, it's only a week. Uh, people would plan for a week or so, but you know, sometimes it's a couple of months. If you have a very dry summer like we're having this year, or like we had back in 2016, which is the driest I've ever seen it here, um, you, you know, people could be out of work for a long time. There's no guarantees. There's no supplemental pay. There's just nothing to help people along. So they had to scrounge. A lot of people in town, this is another thing we found with our immigrant study a few years ago, a lot of people in town tried to... Um, once there's more industrial factories in town, they tried very hard to make sure that they could maintain some semblance of income by having different people in the family work at different factories. So they might have someone working at the Exeter Manufacturing Company, our last big water industry, um, and somebody else might be working at a shoe shop. So that way they wouldn't all be out of work at the same time. Um, so the extra manufacturing company did get supplemental steam power in the 1870s. One of those little uh, sawmills that you saw, the one on Kimball's Island, was maintained by the extra manufacturing company far longer than I assumed. I think it was up until the 1920s even, uh, so that they could still, they could always use wood in case they needed that as a power source. Here's some of the workers in the 1890s. 
Most of these people would probably be immigrants from all across the, uh, the world. Uh, eventually, they began to hire people of Irish heritage, and then Germans, Poles. Uh, but the one group they refused to hire in Exeter were African Americans. Even people who had ancestors who had served in the American Revolution couldn't get a job at the Exeter Manufacturing Company. Why is that? Because they were prejudiced. They didn't want to hire black people. It's that straightforward. There's no other excuse for it. But these folks here had a lot to be proud of for their work. By the turn of the century in the 1900s, the uh, Exeter Manufacturing Company was using 5,000 bales of cotton per year. They had 300 workers, and they made 7 million lot yards of cotton cloth at that time period. They weathered the Civil War by shutting down. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a sad story. During the Civil War, all the cotton's coming in from the South, right? All of the cotton that's coming in from the 1830s when it opens through the American Civil War is picked by enslaved people and grown by enslaved people. All of that comes in. When the Civil War hits, the Exeter Manufacturing Company simply closed and they kept all of their bales of cotton that they had that they were going to produce in a warehouse. So the following, because they thought the war was going to be over quickly, they shut down. The following year, they sold most of that cotton. So all the shareholders got a pretty good payout the second year of the Civil War. And then the next year, they realized they were going to have to produce something. Now, where they got their cotton from, they were on about half production the next two years. Uh, where they got their cotton is unknown. There's some talk of trying to get cotton from India or trying to get cotton from South America, but that's a pretty long haul, and I doubt very much they did that. There were also advertisements throughout New England looking for any cotton they could get, even the grubby stuff that was inside your mattress. If it was still raw cotton, they would buy it from you. So that's probably how they pulled it off. There was still some kind, maybe they were using contraband cotton that had been uh, seized from the Southern uh, states, but um, they did manage to pull it off and get their way through that. The Great Depression was hard on a lot of workers. The, 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 the mill actually lowered its hours down to what the progressives had been asking for for a long time, an eight-hour workday. And they finally did that in Exeter in, during the Great Depression. There was never a union. There was never any kind of um, strike that went on, mostly because the Exeter Manufacturing Company would just fire you if you went on strike or even talked about it. Uh, the Gale Shoe Shop up, up, up the road a little ways didn't have quite that luck. They had a, a number of strikes. They always managed to break them. But they, they brag about this in uh, various places. In that, that film that you see, The March of Time, they talk about there's never been talk of a labor uprising. That doesn't mean people liked it. That just means they they couldn't get through it. Here's a shot of uh, one of those fires that occurred during the time period. There's one in the 1880s and one in the 1890s. <clears throat> one of them obviously in the winter time because you can see the icicles forming from where the firefighters came in. Each time the mill burned, they rebuilt, they got all new equipment, and they actually managed to come back better. By the 1950s, however, the 1950s is the last time that they are actually producing cotton textiles in the Exeter Manufacturing Company. Make sure I got a picture of this. Here we go. Here's the inside. <clears throat> Just before conversion over. The mill had been run by this time by the Kent family for quite some time. Whoops. Go back. Go back. Go back. That's a pretty shit shot, but it's not what I wanted to show you. Here we go. <laughs> That's not gonna. Okay, uh, the Exeter. This is thirty seconds of of just the the Exeter River running for you. So I hope you enjoy it. The Exeter Manufacturing Company stopped producing cotton fabric in the nineteen fifties, and it turned to synthetics. They made all sorts of synthetic fabrics at that time. They did the. Um, the tape that's used on a typewriter ribbon, they did cloth that was called coffin cloth because it was a kind of a, a rough weave of a synthetic. Um, they um, eventually sold out to a company named called Milliken in 1966, and it was no longer run by the Kent family. In 1981, the mill was sold to the Nike Shoe Company. Nike gets their start here in Exeter. That's kind of cool. There we go. I'll go back to this one. <clears throat> In 1984, Nike left, and the building was turned into housing, which is what it is today. And with that, even though they weren't using 
water power by that time. That's the end of our water-based uh, mills in Exeter. So I haven't seen a lot of questions, but I will see if, if you have any that you would like to ask me. Hopefully I can, um, I can answer any. So this is your chance. If you have a question about Exeter Mills, please feel free to put it into the, uh, the Q&A section. Hi, Barbara, it's Jillian. We have a couple questions for you actually in the Q&A if you wanna go through those. Okay. So going back to the beginning of the program, I believe it was uh, when you were talking about um, uh, some of the lumber mills, uh, you mentioned Wilson's Creek. Uh, people would like to know where that is in town. Where is Wilson's Creek? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to find a map. So let me go back to my share screen and I'm gonna pull up a map. Hopefully this will let me go back. No. While you're doing that, just want to say Melissa says, thank you for the knowledge, so. <laughs> thank you. Um, I said that Wilson, uh, Thomas Wilson was the first um, mill that we had in Exeter, and it was located right over here on this. Can you see the share? I hope. I can see the share. Okay. Um, so Wilson was right over here. I don't think it was a Wilson's Creek at that time. I think it was, uh, this was where he had his grist mill, probably over on this shore. I've always seen it listed as being on the eastern shore. For a long time, we, that sign that I took a picture of was located on the other side of the bridge, but today they've, they've put it in the right place. So it was right over in this area. Uh, there's no creek that comes in in that spot. So I guess that was my, my question. Uh, that was my answer. There's a Wheelwrights Creek that comes out. If you go down farther on the, uh, on the Exeter, on the Squamscott River, you'll see a Wheelwrights Creek. I don't know about Wilson's. So I don't know if that answered it, Karen, but. <laughs> All right, well, next we're moving on to the gunpowder mills. Uh, where would, that, where, uh, sorry, where would saltpeter have come from? Oh, you must have known the answer to this one before you asked. It is derived from urine, either animal or human, because it's a form of ammonia. Yuck. <laughs> I think maybe the question is more like where locally they would have sourced it, but. <laughs> well, they probably got it locally. <laughs> <Just down. laughs> uh, that was the kind of thing that you could, you could collect urine and uh, turn it into powder and uh, by drying it out, I imagine. Okay. Uh, next question on gunpowder mills. How would the scale of these compare to some of the mills at DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware in the early 1800s? Well, I'm not familiar with the gunpowder mills in DuPont in Williamton, Wilmington, Delaware, but I'm going to take a stab at saying that our, ours were very small. Um, for a number of years, I was in contact with someone who was trying to find a, a gunpowder, a barrel that would say Whipple on it, or at least King's, Fall, King's Falls gunpowder on it um, but he was never able to find one he was a collector and was really trying to track it down so i had the feeling that ours was quite small it's also possible that most of the gunpowder that was made here in town was primarily used right in the area so um, you know there was a need for black powder people are still hunting with uh, um, rifles that needed black powder and they also would use it for a number of other things they, they would uh, to try and remove stumps or large rocks from the field sometimes you 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 would blow them up i mean that was one of the methods that they used so it was probably used locally excellent okay from john did the mills ever use coal power instead of water power they had steam well, that, that's possible. Yes, my my guess is yes that they were using coal. Coal came up the uh, ex the Squamscott River on large barges, and they had to have been powering the steam plant somehow. And my guess is it was probably coal. The fact that they still had a small um, sawmill, I think, was auxiliary power. They were probably using coal. A lot of coal came up the river. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Right. Okay, from Tom, we actually have a couple things here. 
Tom says he was wondering if he knew the location of Nicholas Listen's sawmills, uh, who were hired as Scottish indentures. No, oh, who hired Scottish indentures. Ah, okay. Well, he's not on our early maps because he's here before the 1802 map, which is the earliest one that we have. Let me find that one of the outskirts of town. Outskirts, I'm calling it. Um, the Listen mills were out by Gordon, Nathaniel Gordon out here, I believe. And then he moves, I think, and he has a, a mill um, that is in what today I think we would call New Market. But back then was part of Exeter until the 1740s. So I think when you're looking for Nicholas Liston, you have to look for him there. He might also be, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so um, he might also be related uh, to the Stratum area. Um, I think I remember him being out there as well. No, that's Sinclair, sorry. Um, but Nicholas Liston, I believe, is uh, for what we would call New Market today, after he's out here with Nathaniel Gordon. But he's not on this map because this is 1802, and he's 200 years dead by this time. Uh -oh. right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I see, Tom, you said you had another question about Wheelwright's Creek. If you type that in, I'll get back to you on that one. Wheelwright's Creek. Uh, oh, I see down. it. It just came up. On one of your maps in the office, you show a wing of Wheelwright's Creek that uh, Hall's Reach. What is Hall's Reach? Oh, okay. I've only heard of one reach, and that is, um, I thought it was Sinclair's reach, which is on the 1802 map. I don't have the full map. It's out on this, off the Squamscott River. And a, a reach, I believe, is uh, similar to a wharf. It's a place where you can put in a boat, pull out a boat, uh, but I don't, I, I think it's, it's I don't think it's actually a built object. Um, Hall's Reach, I have not heard of. Um, the Halls lived closer to Great Bridge, where Hall Place is today, and they go all the way back to the 1630s. That's a family that's been in the region for a long time. So I'm not certain on that one. I'm getting a comment here that says Ralph Hall, Lieutenant Ralph Hall had property there. Ralph Hall, uh, right. That might be something worth uh, researching into in the future. Yeah, yeah. All right, Maybe. great. All right. Next, um, many New Hampshire mill towns had a lot of similar buildings as mill workers housing. You mentioned Long Block. Where was other mill housing? Oh, well, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint for you because I had a photo of that area. Okay, if you look at this photo here, which you can see, yes? I can see the photo. Re reassure me that you can see it. I can see okay. it, so I'm hoping everyone else can. No one is yelling at me too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a photo probably from the 1920s, I think. And you can see, here's the mill chugging away over here. Here is String Bridge. And here is Great Bridge. And here is the long block that was mill housing, as I mentioned, or tenement housing, as they called it. There was another building that was right here that was the Dean House that was um, not in great shape, but I don't think that it was used as tenements. But here's what we today would call the sea dog or the old loaf and ladle. And you can see that where today there is nothing in this area. There's a big building right here. That is mill workers housing. There's a big building right here, which is also mill workers housing. I think there's one behind the trees as well that goes in this direction. And then over here, you see some buildings. Now today, these are all gone. All of these have been removed for, this is all now Founders Park. And this is where the library is today. So all of these buildings have been removed. So this is, when, when you're talking about the Exeter Manufacturing Company, this region right in here is where a lot of the mill workers lived. You remember in the early days of the mill, you had to live within five minutes of the mill. But as time went on, that wasn't as necessary. Uh, People could get there pretty quickly, and they just didn't put that kind of limitations on people. This Franklin Street region that you see over here 
also had a lot of people who worked in the mill or later in other industries in the area. And a lot of immigrants lived in this neighborhood until they started moving out towards where the, the railroads are, which become the big, that becomes the industrial center of town um, later on after the, uh, after the industrial revolution, after the civil war really. Um, the, the industrial center of Exeter shifts from right in here to out by the railroad tracks, way out that way. So there's a shift. So that's where that's where people live. Now, if you wanted to see what some of these buildings look like, really the only one you're going to find left today is the long block, which today is is turned into um, uh, office space. It's a good reuse of an old building. Most of the other ones are gone. They were removed after World War II. Okay, let's uh, shift to asking some questions about the textile mills. Alexa, who is listening from Baltimore, so shout out to everybody who is listening from not in New Hampshire. We're glad to have you. Um, she would like to know what items the historical society has that's made from the cotton that was produced in Exeter. Probably some of the clothing that we have. We got in some sample packs for a salesman a few years ago. Uh, I think his last name was Kellogg, Warren Kellogg. And he had been um, selling textiles after World War II and we had some of his sales books and we were hoping that some of those fabric swatches would be fabrics that came from the Exeter Manufacturing Company. Um, and they still might be, he doesn't label where they came from. At that time, he was selling the types of fabrics that would be used to make, you know, like tennis shoes. So it was a very heavyweight canvas. Um, but we're not sure. And so we can't put it out and say, this is definitely something that was uh, used made at the Exeter Manufacturing Company um, because we're, we're just not sure. His sales record for a couple of years after the swatches were made indicated that he was mostly selling from other mills. So I guess my short answer is, I'm sorry, Alexa, but I don't think we have anything we can definitively say was made in the Exeter Manufacturing Company. I believe his shoes from the Gale factory, but that's not water powered. So that's another program. No, we're not talking about the Gale shoes. We'll no. talk about other industries on another day. Excellent. <laughs> All right, also adjacent to the cotton processing, Philip asks, where was the machinery made that was used for the processing of cotton? The original machinery came direct from England because that's where it had been created. Um, eventually, it must have been produced somewhere in the United States. We didn't have a huge, I mean, we had the um, Exeter Machine Works in Exeter that made large pieces of machinery, but I do not believe it was looms or anything in that design. It was more boilers. So they may have made the steam plant from the Exeter Machine Works, but I, I'm not sure where the um, the machinery was made eventually. Like I said, they retooled every time there was a fire and the original equipment we know came from Great Britain. So that's as far as I can go on that. More to be found. All right. Oh, B. Dalton says hello from Arizona. Hello, Hi, glad Bea. to have you. <laughs> yep, I see all the people are from Kentucky. So we've got people from everywhere, so. Oh, I'm so glad everybody was able to come. That's the fun part about a Zoom meeting that we can, when we have in-person meetings, we get we get a lot of people locally, but it's we don't always get the, the people who've moved away or just wanted to find out a little bit about Exeter, New Hampshire. Oh, oh and a, a side note, Karen would like to comment that uh, Bob believes the machinery was made in Andover, Massachusetts for the oh, factory, that's so that's possible. Okay, that's possible, yeah. yeah. I'm sure there's a way to find out. We could go through the books. It's just I've never been asked that before. So that's a, that's a, that's a cool new question to, to look at. Email us your research questions, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Lots well, more. I, you know, I hadn't actually uh, looked much into William Perry's starch factory. So I think I'm going to probably write that one up for next week um, for the Exeter newsletter and for our blog, because I'm, I'm very curious about Dr. William Perry and his dipping his foot into a little bit of the industrial world there. He's quite an interesting person. I think I'll do that next week. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Okay, we've got a couple more. Okay. Uh, from Dave, was the Nike mill in the location of the current Exeter mills? It was in the current Exeter mills and then it moved. If you're wondering why you seem to remember it back in the old Wise factory over on Front Street, which is today, um, West End condominiums, I think. Um, it's because it did, it moved. 
it started out in the Exeter Manufacturing Company, then it moved out to uh, out near the railroad tracks on Front Street. So it was in two different locations, and then their storefront was downtown, where we used to be able to buy Nike shoes. But really did get a start in Exeter, which is pretty neat. Okay. And then just a couple more sort of adjacent to the river type questions. Okay. Um, Barry Faster says, I see Jail Street and Prison Street on the east side of the river on one of your maps. Where was this jail? Ah. See if I can find it for you. Never goes to the map I want it to. Okay. Yes, you saw a jail street and a prison street, and it was on that street that today, let's see, today it's, it's still hard to figure out what is Pleasant Street and what is Chestnut Street. <clears throat> but here's the Great Bridge. I'm always going to keep orienting toward the old loaf and ladle, which is right here. Okay. And the library today is down here. So on this map, uh, there it's Pleasant Street, but then right here it's called Prison Street because the county jail is right here. Okay, and this is the 1845 map, but you'll also find it says uh, county prison or county jail on the 1802 map um, because it was located right there until the mid 19th century. And then they moved the jail out to Forest Street, which I don't have a map of right now. But if you go down Forest Street today, down by the spring, You'll see a brick building out there that's apartments, and that is the second jail that we had in Exeter. And then after that, it became a county um, uh, building, and uh, it moved after that. But that's where it was, right there. It was a terrible jail, by the way. Anybody could break out. You could do it, you know, with slippers on, because uh, people used to escape from it all the time. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Well, that's, a, that's another story we're going to want to hear, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. From Wendy and Fred, was the Kent family part of the Exeter Mills? Yes, they were. The Kent family owned mills in Exeter and in Pittsfield. I think it's Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And they eventually come to Exeter and they settle here. Uh, the original, I don't know if he was really the owner or the manager, was Hervey Kent. And then it went to his son, George. And then after George's death, um, it went to the second Herbie Kent. So if you've seen that 1941 March of Time film, they talk about Herbie Kent in there. And they make it sound as though he is basically running the town, that he owns the bank and he owns the newspaper and he owns the mill and there's just no labor problems. As though he's this benevolent industrialist. Um, he, he didn't. Uh, Harry Thayer once corrected me. He definitely didn't own the Exeter newsletter. He did have some uh, say in it, but he didn't actually own it. And um, he did run the bank, um, but he didn't govern the town as much as, as as it sounds in that film. They're they're trying to make sort of a folksy New England town, and here's the rich guy. Uh, but the Kents did run the run the mill for three generations at least. Okay. And then another just adjacent to the river question. Karen is asking that during the alewife run this spring, New Hampshire Fishing Game was uh, rescuing fish at this uh, the spring bridge who were unable to climb the rocks. And she was told that a fish ladder had been removed during dam removal. Is that true? Yeah, it was. The fish ladder was put in in the 1960s, I think 1968 or 1969. And it was never a very efficient fish ladder. Uh, it was very difficult for the fish to navigate through it. I'm not sure why the fishing game was rescuing fish at String Bridge this year. It could be that the water levels were extremely low this year. It could have been that they were doing more of a count of the fish to find out how they were doing. I know the fish have come back. We would, we would need to hear from uh, someone who would really know that, like Bob Glowacki, would probably know the answer to that question right off the top of his head. The fish ladder was removed when the dam was removed. It had been inadequate for a number of years anyway and wasn't serving the purpose. The open river actually lets through more fish at this point in time than the fish ladder ever did. So it was, it was worth trying, I guess, because before that, there was no way the fish could get through. Okay. So well, that is the last question I have here in the open Q&A session. So anyone else get your questions in, type them in. <laughs> <laughs> and I 
want to recommend. I want to recommend a book before I go. Well, let me get rid of my screen here because you don't need that anymore. Um, I want to recommend a book. This book by Olive Tardif. I don't know how well you can see it. It's called Exeter Squamscott River of Many Uses. And she talks all about the river. She talks about the mills. She talks about the indigenous populations. Uh, some of it is a little bit out of date, um, but I, I love this book. Um, you can get it through the Exeter Historical Society. You can probably get it in other places, but you can get it through our website if you're interested. I think it's only about $10. It's a really fun book if you're interested in the river. And um, you know, it takes you right up to the end of Nike owning the Millican, the old uh, Exeter Manufacturing Company, and then, then she's done. <laughs> because <laughs> it was written a number of years back. But it's a good little resource for you if you're interested in, in this book. Okay. Judy says, thank you. Very interesting program. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad everybody was able to come. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, thank you, Tom. General shout out to Jillian and Barbara. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Coming Thanks out. for coming tonight. And I think if Laura's still there, we're going to link it to our website at the end here. All right. See, people are popping out. So have a good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. All right. And Barbara, while well, I got you here, Karen has some information for you regarding the uh, machinery made in Andover, Mass. So I'll relay that to you. Excellent. I'd love to find out that. Yes. And Alexa, you so know, I, I think I have some vintage thread for you. <laughs> yeah. As Alexa's I, also texting me right now. So anyone who's still here, Alexa's my sister. So <laughs> she's very excited. She used to volunteer at the Historical Society coming from Baltimore. So. <laughs> But yeah, Davis and Ferber Manufacturing in North Andover maybe had some. Davis and yeah. Ferber. Yeah. That is highly likely because I would imagine that they would get something that was fairly local. Um, yeah. I'm going to write EMC. I mean, the railroad's coming right in, so could bring yeah. in your items for you. Good to know. I mean, Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Hello to the 13 people who are still here listening to our historian chat. <laughs> Talking about vintage thread and machinery. Everything interests us. That's the fun part about working with people who are into history. We're never bored. We love everything. Oh, Wendy Keith. I didn't even, I didn't recognize you. So, yes, thank you. Wendy says, nice to see former student doing things. So, I... <laughs> And congratulations to Amy Lee. <laughs> Is there anything else you guys would like? Thank you so much. No trouble. Okay, thank you so much.